Hey everybody, Chris Gilmore here from Chris Outdoors in Wild Muskoka and some of you might know me from a, a blog and a project that I used to run, Changing World, and that's kind of uh, morphing into what I'm doing with Chris Outdoors right now. Tonight's presentation I think is super timely and super relevant. It's called Becoming Self-Reliant and Resilient in 2021 and I put it together for a couple of reasons. Uh, the main one being I just know so many people in my circle and I know so many people in my community and part of the newsletter. Uh, that have a lot of concerns about the world and at the same time uh, they're just totally exhausted and burnt out from everything we've been through in 2020 in the past year. You know it's really been a challenging year for a lot of reasons for a lot of people and there's this tough situation that a lot of us sell, uh, find ourselves in where it's like oh my goodness we're just overwhelmed by what it takes to to just get by in the present day you know paying the bills and kids and mortgages and rent and work and life you know. Uh, and then trying to actually have some quality of life as well and spend time with family. And yet we also know that the world is changing incredibly quickly. And, you know, we probably should be thinking about how we're actually adapting. So how do we live in both those places at the same time? Um, so that's a big part of why I put this presentation together tonight to share some of the real practical steps that I've kind of learned in my 20 year journey uh, in trying to reach some degree of self-reliance. So I think this is going to make a lot of sense as we go through. There's going to be a lot of practical tips that I'm sharing. Uh, I want this workshop to be um, super informative. I want it to be entertaining and inspiring. And I also want it to be actionable. So in part two of the workshop, we're actually going to have you pull out a notebook and we're going to do some interactive exercises. So you're not just listening to me talk the whole time. So I really hope that you stick around for the entire uh, presentation. And I'm not even calling it a presentation. This is more of a workshop. I want you to leave tonight with some practical steps that actually feel realistic uh, within the context of your actual situation right now and things that help you create some peace of mind and some confidence in this you know, somewhat uncertain world we live in where we don't really know what's around the next corner. So with that said, uh, let's dive in. So what are we gonna cover in tonight's presentation? Uh, one thing I'd like to do is actually reframe the concept of crisis a little bit. Uh, and I wanna take it from being this like fear-based place that a lot of people uh, are in right now uh, to, you know, a more holistic approach to looking at change and uncertainty and kind of empowering it as natural resiliency. And I'll, I'll tell you what I mean by empowering it as natural resiliency uh, in, yeah, shortly here. Uh, the second thing we want to get into is I'm going to share some of the top lessons from our, and I say our because uh, my wife and I, um, we've been on about a 20 year journey together into trying to become as self-reliant as possible. And we've been building a homestead for the past 10 years. And oh my goodness, we have so many lessons from uh, buying a piece of land and trying to get it to the point where we provide for a lot of our needs. Uh, food, energy, water, um, health care even. Um, so I've got lots of kind of practical tips along that journey. And whether you want a homestead or not, uh, I think you'll be able to glean some lessons from this that you can apply to whatever your situation is. Whether it's you're in an urban area or whether you're rural or whether you're wilderness, I'm hoping there'll be practical takeaways for all of you in sharing some of the lessons from our journey into self-reliance. I'll also speak a little bit about why I feel self-reliance just makes so much sense. Uh, and part of that comes from some insights I'm going to share from you from actually working in the field of emergency and disaster management and working with governments and businesses. Uh, I got a little bit of, I guess you could call insider uh, insights for you that I think you'll find very helpful um, and, and maybe a little bit of a wake up call too. Uh, the third part of this is we're going to dive into the actual interactive component that I already referenced. Um, and I want to share some tips uh, around kind of creating a realistic roadmap towards your improved self-reliance. Um, and realistic is super important here and it needs to fit your unique situation. And I've got some tips uh, that I'd like to share on how you might be able to apply that. Uh, the fourth part here is I'm going to share some of my top concerns about the world right now, um, where I think things are kind of going in the next kind of one to five to ten years, and some of the steps that I'm actually taking to, to prepare for them and to mitigate against them. So I think you might find that uh, interesting and insightful. And then I'm also going to, throughout the whole presentation, be sharing all kinds of uh, top resources and making some suggestions for next steps uh, when it comes to gear, books, courses, free videos, uh, tips for gardening, all kinds of things in, in that kind of nature. So I really hope you enjoy this presentation. I hope you stick around right till the end. I will mention I'm going to send out an email because I this is going to be a serious download. Uh, of info. So I'm going to actually send out one or two emails after you watch the presentation um, with links to a bunch of the resources. So just so you know, watch your inbox for from an email from chris at chrisoutdoors.ca uh, with some follow-up info. Okay, 
So why don't I do uh, a little bit of an intro to, to myself and my wife, Laura, uh, and our journey, just to pr create a little bit of context to why we have the experience that we do and the insight that we do, and uh, a lot of the lessons that we've learned over the years. Uh, and I can tell you a lot of those lessons come from uh, making mistakes and doing things the hard way. Uh, and hopefully I can help speed up your journey in the same process. So to make a long story short, um, you know, a lot of you folks maybe know me as an outdoors guy. Uh, for the last kind of 15 years, that's been a big part of my work, you know, teaching wilderness survival. I've helped run summer camps for kids, connecting kids with nature. I teach wildlife tracking, um, things of that nature. Um, but what some of you might not know is that a big part of my journey outside of just being a nature guy is actually been around this, this concept of self-reliance. And uh, over the last kind of seven years, I've actually done a lot of work in professional emergency and disaster management. So um, let me just give you a really, really quick uh, lineage of our, our story here. So 20 years ago, uh, I start, I was really into environmental activism. I was uh, really starting to get worried about the state of the world and where it was going. Uh, looking at things like climate change, environmental degradation, species extinction, uh, things like that. And I started thinking, geez, what, what do I do about this? Um, and that led me into one, studying ecology and wanting to know how to be a better steward of the earth. Um, and it also made me realize like, you know, one of the solutions I think to a lot of our problems is becoming more sustainable uh, regionally. So I started, basically my wife and I traveled all over North America going and training at various different farms and learning how to grow food, learning how to grow herbs, learning how to work the land, uh, learning how to develop skills. Uh, so that was part one of the journey. And then part two of the journey was realizing like, oh my goodness, now we're learning all about kind of growing this food in the homestead. But what about, uh, what about the wilderness? What about nature? Um, you know, how could we survive if we lost our crop for the year? You know, how would we survive if our modern world, if parts of it came crumbled, whether it's temporarily from a disaster or long term from a, a big situation? So that led us into diving deep into the realm of studying wilderness survival and things like herbal medicine and um, things of that nature. So jump forward another. So there's, you know, another kind of like eight years in there. Uh, jump forward a few more years and I've been doing this for a long time. I was doing wilderness guiding. I was teaching survival. Uh, we were growing our homestead and um, I started thinking about, okay, cool. I've learned all these self-sufficiency skills and self-reliance skills. Uh, I know a lot about the woods, uh, but what does it look like to kind of find balance with this in our modern world? And how do we start doing this on kind of a community level, making communities more self-reliant and more resilient? And one thing I decided to do, uh, I started thinking, you know, I got a feeling we're going to see some major upheavals in the, the short term. Um, and to be honest, I was thinking about pandemics kind of five, six years ago and thinking, you know what, I bet you we're going to see a big pandemic in my lifetime. Um, so I actually went back to school and I started studying emergency and disaster management uh, on a college level and started taking certs on a provincial level. Long story short, uh, I ended up working for a large uh, um, emergency management consulting firm, one of the largest ones in Canada. And I got the, the fortune of actually uh, being involved with some big projects with governments where we would do like mock emergency disaster uh, scenarios. So for example, with one group, we, uh, I went down to this municipality and we had the fire chief, we had the police, we had their EMS, we had all of their town council members. And we basically ran a giant mock earthquake exercise and said, okay, how would all of these services respond if there was a massive earthquake in this area? So I got to actually help facilitate this experience. Uh, and I got to get a real insight into how the city would respond behind the scenes as well. Uh, I've also done exercises with hospitals. I've done a lot of work with summer camps, with farms, with nonprofit organizations basically helping them kind of test their resiliency and their emergency plans. Um, so that's kind of been a, you know, my journey in the nutshell. Um, and I kind of bring all of that together with my, my organization, Chris Outdoors. And the way that I kind of look at it is, you know, modern day emergency management has some amazing tool sets around organization, around gear, around response, uh, around how to save lives. But in my mind, it's actually missing a few other pieces. And those are actually filled in uh, by these other components of my life. So the three things that I try to bring together in my kind of philosophy and approach is one, uh, a deep connection to the land and a deep knowledge of nature. Because the ecology that we live in, the ecosystems, the habitats around us, that's what supports all life. It's the foundation. And if we don't have a relationship with that, and if we don't tend it in a good way, uh, it doesn't matter how good our gear, our knowledge, our systems are, they're just not going to work. Um, the next component of that, of that is this idea of self-reliance. So the skill sets, the knowledge, um, 
the the gear the systems to to live in a more sustainable way and to be more self-reliant when infrastructure isn't there to support us and then the third part is like what are the best tools of the modern emergency response frameworks so that's kind of our my story is kind of holistically bringing those three things together into a framework that everyday people like yourselves uh, can apply to their own self-reliance and resiliency and to provide systems and tools that we can actually apply as small communities or in inner bio regions to be more adaptable to, you know, whether it's another pandemic or an economic recession or an extreme weather event from climate change or a disaster that brings the electrical grid down for a period of time. Um, I think it's a holistic school tool set that really sets us up for the future. So maybe before I move on, I'll just uh, I'll just explain a couple of the pictures on here. So over on the uh, the left of the screen there, you'll see uh, the start of our herb garden there with a bunch of perennial herbs. Uh, the bottom left, there's a, a picture from a, a wilderness survival shelter. Um, in the middle there, there's a picture of me actually uh, in an emergency operations at the World Conference on Disaster Management um, from my professional work there. And then over on the right, uh, you see a few pictures kind of from our homestead and other survivals. That's my beautiful wife there with the cauliflower and broccoli from our garden. So there's just a little uh, thought on the pictures there. So I want to share one of the top lessons that's come to me over the years. And uh, this is the part I said, kind of the official part one, where I want to reframe the concept of crisis. Um, you know, I'm going to, I'll be the first one to admit in my early twenties, I was a little bit of a chicken little kind of person. Um, and I think there was justifications for it, but you know, I was always shouting, you know, the sky is falling, the environment's collapsing, the climate's collapsing, the economy's collapsing. And I thought that things were actually going to fall apart. Like in the next like few years, uh, this was 20 years ago. Uh, cause I'm 40 now that was back in my twenties. And I was really concerned that we were, things were tanking. And ironically at the time, I remember having this conversation with my dad and him telling me, you know, Chris, I, I understand all the things you're concerned about, but I also had friends back in the 60s and 70s that were saying the same thing, and they were convinced everything was crashing and coming down. Uh, so here we are, it's 20 years later, the economy hasn't collapsed, the environment hasn't completely collapsed, the power grid hasn't collapsed, the world hasn't collapsed, everything's kind of going along. In fact, the economy has had one of the biggest booms ever. Now, is it going to keep going in that direction? Uh, I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball. Um, and that's one of the big lessons I've come up with is to not be naive or arrogant and think that I can actually predict the future. Uh, I can't, um, and I've been wrong before. Now, what I can say is that as a tracker and someone that understands ecology, I can say that we're seeing some pretty bad trends that are continuing to decline downwards from an ecological perspective. And knowing that that's the foundation of everything else, that worries me. The other part there I can say is through my work in emergency and disaster management, working with municipalities, I can tell you that most municipalities, most governments aren't actually as prepared as we would like them to be. Uh, and that a lot of our infrastructure, whether it's the power grid, whether it's transportation, whether it's the food in the grocery stores, uh, communications are not nearly as stable as a lot of us would like them to be. Now, these are things that we rely on every single day from the external world. Um, and they might seem really strong because they're all always there for us, but it actually doesn't take much to knock those out. And we've seen examples of that, you know, whether it was empty shelves at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, whether it was what happened recently over in Texas with that massive power outage um, that actually cost a lot of lives. Uh, and, you know, people are going to be recovering that for, from that from a long time. There's a lot of things that can take down our infrastructure really quick. So I would say a lot of the systems and infrastructure of our modern world are not resilient. Uh, I say that actually quite confidently, uh, and I think we should stop being so naive to just expect those things to be with there for us, which is why we should really be thinking about building our own self-reliance as individuals, as families, uh, as communities, as bioregions. But I don't want to scare you there because here's, here's the part that I want to use to kind of reframe that, that scary part there. When I said that, you know, I used to think everything was going to collapse. Well, when things didn't collapse, I started looking a little bit longer term. Uh, and when I say long term, I'm not just talking about, you know, 10, 20, 30 years. I'm talking about hundreds of years and thousands of years and tens of thousands of years. And when I started looking at that, what I realized is that, you know, uh, uncertainty, um, climate change, extreme events, not knowing what's around the next corner. That's actually been the norm for 200,000 years of human history. Uh, we've actually experienced humans, even modern humans, have experienced massive quick climate change. Back in the 1300s, there was a little ice age that hit Europe in a big chart part of the world. Um, 
where things, you know, the ice started growing, the temperatures drop, crops started failing, and it kind of lasted two, three hundred years, and then it shifted and came back out of it. So there is an argument that climate change is speeding up again, but climate change is actually not a new thing. Um, it's, it's actually been around for a long time. And if you think back before we had all this modern infrastructure, every single day, um, you know, there's predators on the landscape. We don't necessarily know where the next meal is going to come from. Disasters can strike. So I want to throw out the, the argument that humans are actually designed for this and that we've just become a little bit complacent in the last kind of couple hundred years because of how reliant we've become on modern infrastructure. And that if we rebuild our relationship with the natural world, um, and that helps support both our mind and our bodies and our spirits, and we start developing skills and we start um, working together in communities, that we're actually incredibly resilient and that we're actually designed for some of the challenges in front of us right now. So here's the good news. We're part of nature. Nature is resilient and so are you. Um, so I think that's just a way more positive perspective to think about some of these challenges of the future. We just need to kind of get over this little hurdle of this, this stuck place we're in right now and the overwhelm of the modern world versus wanting to reclaim this resilient part of ourselves. And one way that we can start to do that is start to think about designing our lives like an ecosystem in order to solve problems, problems and challenges. And that's where a lot of my practice is actually taking from uh, lessons from nature and the strength of ecosystems and applying that to like systems in emergency and disaster management, applying it to how we design our farms uh, and our homesteads and grow food, applying it to how we even design our businesses. And I'll share what that actually looks like shortly. So I'm going to share a little bit of an insight into this. So this is part two. That was part one, uh, reframing resiliency. Part number two uh, is sharing, you know, some of the top lessons from our 20 year quest in homesteading and self-reliance. So if you go back 20 years ago and I put 10 years in the, the slide here because this is talking about kind of a 10 year period of life, um, a 10 year phase. And this is important, this 10 year piece. So phase one of this story. Uh, my wife and I, we're broke. Uh, we don't have a homestead. We don't have any money to buy a homestead. We just know that we want to live off the land one day or, or live in balance with the land and grow a lot of our food one day. But that seems so far from where we are in this moment. So for those of you that feel like you're in that state, just know that I was there. Uh, there's a way forward. Um, and I'm going to share some steps on how to do that. So what can we do? Well, you know, a lot of people I find, and I see this a lot, is people get really focused on this, you know, this dream, this ideal vision, you know, that I want to live off the land, or maybe you don't want to live off the land, you know, it's I want the sustainable world, I want this urban homestead, whatever it is. And then when it feels too vast and overwhelmed, we actually feel defeated, and it actually just stops us in our tracks. You know, and when I think back in my early 20s, the number of folks I was around at that time that said, oh, yeah, I want to have a homestead one day, and I want to do all these things. Uh, the majority of them never actually did it. Now, whether they actually just changed their minds and wanted something different, which is totally legit, um, but I suspect some of them actually did want that. They just got overwhelmed by the dream, focusing on that big end, um, and didn't spend enough time consistently carrying out those little steps to get there, and that's, that's what uh, they missed out or why it, it didn't manifest for them. So step number one, work with what we already have and don't get so focused on what we don't have. Don't get overwhelmed small consistent steps they compound over time like interest and that's been one of my biggest lessons over this 20 year journey so what can we do back then 20 years ago well we can start figuring out how do we build our credit so we can actually apply for a mortgage uh, how do we save to get a down payment and we can start learning skills for our future and i'll tell you something really interesting you know there's i've watched so many people move out of urban areas to start homesteads you know they get a chunk of money whether it's inheritance or they make money off their home and they're like great we want to go live in the country uh, we're going to buy some land and go and homestead but they move up there without the skills and i've seen a lot of scenarios where people buy that amazing dream home and a couple years later they're they're burnt out they're exhausted uh things aren't working they're frustrated and they sell their home and move back to the city so I say this, not that you can't do that, but I say this to say, if you can't actually afford that homestead right now, and that's part of your dream, that might actually be in your advantage. Uh, slow, steady growth, I find tends to work a lot better than really quick leaps sometimes. And what you can do right now is actually start building the skill sets to be able to homestead. So one day when you get that piece of land, you actually have the skills to, to live on it and do something with it. Um, so what are some of the actions that we took back then? 
Well, we started learning about the foundations of growing food. And, you know, I kind of laugh about this sometimes, you know, because I know uh, I've got a lot of friends that are kind of in the prepper community, um, you know, that are, yeah, you probably know what that word is. Maybe if you don't, you can look it up, this concept of preppers. And some of these folks, you know, they, they'll go and they'll buy these jars full of seeds. So they'll have thousands and thousands of heritage seeds. And they're in this jar where they're preserved for, you know, 20 years or 50 years or whatever. And they're like, okay, you know, if the world falls apart, I'm going to move up north and we'll start a garden. And these seeds are going to be what I live off of. But they don't actually garden now. And I kind of laugh as someone that's been growing food for tw over 20 years now, actually. It's like, there's a lot to know on how to grow food. And if you think you're just going to like, the apocalypse is going to come and you're going to head into the bush and start a garden and just grow these seeds out of these cans, you're, you're not going to be sustaining yourself off of that. You know, sorry, wake up call there. That's not practical. So what really makes sense is in the short term to actually just start, you know, you might think, and I know a lot of people at the beginning of this pandemic, there was a huge surge of people wanting to grow their own food and a huge surge in gardening. And I was talking to people back at the beginning of 2020 that were like, oh man, I live in the city and it's just this little garden bed. This isn't self-reliance. Like I don't actually feel any more food secure. And what I would say to them is like, well, thankfully you don't actually need to live off of your garden right now. And having that little garden, you're learning essential skills that will allow you to scale that and do that better uh, in the future and grow more food in the future. So don't think that that's not, uh, it's not significant. It may feel small and like it's nothing, but it's actually an essential step just to learn some of those basics. And here are a couple ones that I think are some of the most important things to focus on when you're getting started. Number one is actually soil building. If you don't have good, healthy soil, and if you don't know how to regenerate it year after year, so that soil actually gets better over time, uh, you're not gonna grow healthy food and you're gonna have a lot of pests. So learn about composting and even vermicomposting. And this is something you can even do in the city. Vermicomposting is composting with worms. And we actually have a Rubbermaid inside of our house that we grow uh, worms with. They eat all of our compost all winter long. And we've got this big, thick thing of soil ready to put into our gardens. We're actually going to be making something called compost tea with it this year to bring good bacteria into our garden beds. Um, and those worms we can actually feed to our chickens as well. So we're growing chicken food and we're making soil and we're making the foundations of fertilizer all inside. You could do this in an urban apartment and then use that fertilizer to feed your house plants. And you're learning about soil building. Uh, it's super, super relevant, even if it doesn't feel like a lot. The next one I think here is learn what grows well and what doesn't in your region. And the second part I'll put to this, you know, a lot of people when they garden, they just think about like, what do I like to eat or what would be fun to grow? They're not necessarily thinking about like, what plants can I grow that I can actually survive off of it? You know, and when you're thinking about actual survival with your garden, you want to think about things that are high yielding, meaning they produce a lot of fruit and you want stuff that stores well. Those are probably the two biggest factors. And to give you a quick example where I live, you know, I can grow, we grow bell peppers and we grow eggplant in our greenhouse. But bell peppers and eggplant, they use a lot of soil nutrients. They're big. They take up a lot of space. And like my bell pepper plants, I'll get six peppers off them in a year. Um, six peppers is a small portion of a couple meals. There's very few calories in that at all. So if I was actually thinking about a survival situation, I'd just scrap the peppers all together. I'd scrap the eggplants. They take up too much space. Uh, they don't provide enough uh, calories um, and they, they eat up our soil really, really quickly. It's not j worthwhile for us. Now, the flip side of that is growing something like asparagus. Uh, asparagus is incredibly low work and it comes back every single year, year after year, after you plant it once and it produces food just nonstop all spring. And it's, it comes up before there's anything else. So imagine you've just had a long, hard winter and you know, um, your calorie storages are going down, your food caches are going down, and all of a sudden the asparagus starts popping up and it just keeps coming and you clip it and it grows again and you clip it and it grows again. We eat asparagus every single day for about three weeks in the spring. Much more energy efficient than growing bell peppers or eggplant. And there's all kinds of examples. So for now, uh, I just want you to start thinking about and something you can learn right now is just start figuring out, okay, what plants actually produce a lot of food in a small amount of space and aren't a lot of work? and what plants are easy to store. We're still, it's uh, April right now, we're still eating potatoes, squash, and garlic from our garden because those things store really, really well. Uh, the peppers, they were gone before the fall was even over. And then the third one I'll put on here is pest management. Um, start learning how to deal with pests. And I'll share one of the secrets there is healthy soil. 
and knowing what grows in your area. There's some things you just can't grow in your area. So that's another thing to think about there. So anyways, phase one was us just starting to have this little garden plot uh, and starting to learn skills. But we had this other thought, you know? So sure, we're learning these skills for a homestead, but what if something big happens right now? You know, what if there's some sort of mass scale emergency? Because remember, I told you in my early 20s, I was really concerned about like kind of the apocalypse, the collapse of the world. I'm actually less concerned about that now um, based on the, the conversation I shared with you. But we were like, okay, so we can start learning these skills, but what do we do if stuff crashes right now? And I think we were actually quite smart in the way that we approach this. The first thing I did is I remember deciding, okay, I want to make a good emergency kit for our home. Um, so I went out and I bought a backpack and I did a bunch of research on like, you know, what, what should go into an emergency kit. And I put together this emergency backpack that we kept in our car. And I'll tell you, like it was this instant boost in confidence and peace of mind, just knowing that I've got this kit that goes everywhere with me. And if something unexpected happens, you know, a disaster, a riot, the power goes out, whatever, I've got a serious set of tools to provide for shelter, water, fire, food, uh, warmth, uh, first aid, communications for a period of time. It was actually like this big boost in confidence. And uh, it's interesting, I, I run this course called Survive the Storms. It's a super fun online course. You can check it out, www.survivethestorms.com. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but in the course, we basically walk people through like making a communications plan, making emergency kits, all these different things. And I've gotten a handful of really cool emails from people that made emergency kits during that. And then an unexpected event come up and they actually had to use it. Uh, one of them, and these weren't major disasters, but one of them, a girl went to go visit, uh, some friends at a cottage way up North. Uh, her GPS took her the wrong way and she drew way, way down this backcountry road into the middle of nowhere, realized that she was lost and uh, she was nowhere near the cottage and there was nowhere around and then her car broke down and now she's stuck way out in the middle of nowhere in the wilderness and she said this, you know, wave of fear came on but then she remembered, oh, I've got that emergency kit that Chris taught me how to make in my back or in the back of my car and she pulled that out and she walked, she said that kit gave me the confidence to actually walk out because I knew I had shelter, I had water, I had food, um, I had tools, all with me in my car. Uh, another story, this this girl, uh, this was actually this last winter, she was driving home on a major highway and this crazy white oak blizzard came on and she couldn't see even the hood of her car and she pulled over and she realized this blizzard is gonna be here for hours. Um, what am I gonna do? This is kind of scary. Oh, I've got this emergency kit in the back of my car. And she actually spent the night on the side of the highway inside of her car and said it was actually comfortable and somewhat enjoyable. It turned into this fun adventure because she was able to stay warm. She was able to stay entertained. She had food there. Uh, she had water all because of this emergency kit. So making a good emergency kit for your home and for your car are two super high leverage actions. Uh, and I'll share a little bit more on suggestions on how to do that. But that was something that we did uh, close to 20 years ago. And like instantly it was just like confidence, peace of mind went right up. And I use that kit all the time. The second thing we started thinking about was how to learn to forage and hunt. So if we don't have a garden to sustain us, we started thinking about, well, let's just learn the basics of wild foods and let's maybe explore the idea of what it would look like to harvest uh, animals from the land. And of course, if you're going to do that, I really, really want to say that um, make stewardship your top priority. Think about the animals first, not yourself. In a survival situation, if you got to eat, you got to eat and go for it. But if you're not in a survival situation, please think about stewardship and the actual health of the populations. And I totally believe there's a way to hunt and trap in balance with an ecosystem, but there's a lot to learn there. Um, I'll share two actually resources just since we're here right now. If you're interested in learning to wild forage, you can check out my wife's business. Uh, it's called Wild Muskoka, M-U-S-K-O-K-A, -K -K and it's wildmuskoka.com. She sells wild foraged foods. Uh, but she also teaches workshops on how to harvest wild plants and mushrooms for food and how to make your own medicine from the forest. So you might want to check out wildmuskoka.com. And if you're interested in potentially learning to hunt in a way that actually really respects and values the lives of the animal and wants to do it in balance with the ecosystem so that there's still animals to hunt 20 years ago and 100 years from now, not a go in the future, um, you may also want to chat uh, or check out a training that I run called The Hunter's Journey. Uh, and you can go to thehuntersjourney.com. Again, that's thehuntersjourney.com and explore this, this mentorship program we have in kind of hunting in a, a sacral, sacred and respectful way um, for food to feed your family, family. And I really believe it's one of the most sustainable ways to harvest food. 
So anyways, back to actions. So we created a good kit. We started learning about foraging and hunting. We went and took advanced wilderness first aid courses. And again, this is a super high leverage thing that if you haven't done, I suggest you do it. And this is why. Think about this. Basic first aid, you know, St. John's Ambulance, Red Cross. They basically just teach you to, for any serious situation, uh, to keep a person kind of alive and somewhat comfortable until the ambulance shows up and takes over. You don't really learn a lot beyond basic uh, first aid and, you know, CPR. If you take a wilderness first aid, and this this slide should actually say advanced wilderness first aid. So there's one course called the wilderness first responders, and there's another one called wilderness advanced first aid. And those exist in both Canada and the States. And I suspect there's a, an equivalent in other parts of the world. But if you take an advanced wilderness first aid course, even if you live in the city and you're not an outdoors person, what they do is they teach you to respond to a medical emergency when you're more than 24 hours away from um, from help and advanced medical care. And this could be relevant even in a city. Imagine a massive ice storm happens and all of the streets are frozen and you're stuck at home and somebody takes a terrible fall or they have a heart attack or whatever happens uh, and the ambulance can't get to you. So you're in a city, but the ambulance just can't get to you. Think about what happened in uh, Texas, whether it was this massive blackout or Hurricane Harvey, uh, same kind of thing. In a natural disaster, advanced medical help may not be there. Wilderness First Aid actually gives you tools to be able to respond even when advanced help isn't there. So that's a huge one. And we did that again about 20 years ago. We started our journey into advanced first aid and it just made it so much more resilient. Uh, and then the last one is just start learning wilderness survival skills and urban survival skills. So I think that's a solid foundation for just any human being to have that just makes you more resilient. And that was the start of our journey. Uh, phase one. I want to speed through these because I really want to get to the practical part too. So I'm going to go through these next slides kind of quick. So phase two of our plan. So 10 years later, we finally saved up money. We had some credit and we were able to buy our land. And this is the part I want you to learn from right here. The first few years, we started trying to do everything at once because we were just so excited and we're like, oh my goodness, we want to be so much further ahead than we are. So let's plant vegetables. Let's start a tree nursery. Let's do animals. Let's just do all of these things. Let's try and fix up our house. Let's try and get off the grid. And what happened is we planted a lot of things that ended up being a lot of work and they didn't compound like interest where one thing supported the next. They actually all competed with each other for our time and our energy. Uh, now, what we did do right is we kept consistently just taking small steps and we kept learning, but we got burnt out. We wasted a lot of money, but we did learn a lot. Uh, it wasn't that efficient our first few years. So our top lesson coming out of those first few years is like, okay, let's take a break. We need to use intelligent design uh, and think like an ecosystem or a regenerating forest to grow our self-reliance. And there's a whole realm. If you're not familiar what permaculture is, you got to look up the word permaculture. Um, there's an amazing organization that I do some work with. They're called Earth Activist Training. Some of you may know an author named Starhawk. Uh, they run an actual certification course in permaculture you can do online. I highly recommend it out. So study permaculture and uh, check out the book Gaia's Garden. Uh, phenomenal around how do you actually be way more efficient with the way that you design your land and your systems and build them so that instead of all these projects competing for your time and energy, one project actually helps the next project over time. So basically what our plan became after three years into our homestead and feeling like, man, we've been here three years and it just feels like a ton of work and we don't have a lot of food and we don't feel any more sustainable than we were three years ago. Let's start focusing on one project or domain at a time. And then let's make sure that each project supports the next project and feeds into it instead of competes with it. And we basically turn this into a strategic plan where it's like, okay, here's some, we want to do all of this, but let's divide this into short term things, middle term and long term. And getting strategic like that made a world of difference. And then we started thinking about, well, what are those high leverage tasks? The things that are less, least amount of work that are going to get us the biggest results now. So we rein everything in and said, okay, well, let's get chickens. The reason we're going to get chickens is because chickens will, one, uh, they'll create manure, which allows, starts helping to build soil. It helps our composting. Two, we can let the chickens out into the garden in the spring before we do it. And they'll actually go along and they'll manure the garden beds for us. So they're adding fertilizer to our garden beds, but they also eat all kinds of insects and they eat a lot of the invasive insects. So having chickens actually brought down the number of pests in our garden. And then three, 
Um, once spring came around, we closed off the garden and we would let them free range on the land the rest of the time. So it wasn't costing us very much money for food. So we had the system in place where the chickens were actually helping us build soil. They were helping us with pest control. They were providing us eggs and they didn't take much work or much food. That's a high leverage action that creates a lot of work. Or, or, sorry, creates a lot of results. The next one we started doing is focusing on growing perennial crops. So we grew things like shiitake mushrooms because the mushrooms, you know, you inoculate an oak log with shiitakes, you've got eight years of mushrooms with almost no work after the initial input. So we started focusing on perennials like shiitake mushrooms, like planting strawberries, like planting asparagus. And we reined in all of the crops and just focused on crops with the biggest yields uh, and the best for storage and cut out kind of all of the, um, the kind of bonus stuff. Now we came back to that later and I'll get to that, but we just got really, really efficient with our design. So it felt like everything was compounding. Um, this is basically just saying what I already did there. Oh, we also introduced bees, which now increased the pollination and we started getting bigger yields. And suddenly things became a lot less overwhelming. It was still a lot of work, but we were starting to see some results. We were starting to have a significant amount of food and we were having food throughout the year. And then all of a sudden it was like, and this is where I, I share, this is one of the big lessons, you know, at the beginning, it just felt like we weren't getting anywhere. And it was 10 years of feeling like we're never going to get there. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, wow, we can actually afford this place. Sweet. Let's buy our piece of land. And then it's, we were there. And then it was like three years of like <laughs> working ourselves into the grave uh, and not feeling like we got anywhere. And then another three years of trying to get smart. And for those first six years of our homestead, it just felt like work. It didn't actually feel like a homestead. But then all of a sudden, when we hit about year six, I remember having this epiphany one uh, summer where I looked around and I'm like, oh my goodness, we live on a homestead. It's working. There's food absolutely everywhere. And we're not actually working nearly as hard as we were the first few years. So things actually started to compound like interest does in a, in a bank account or a good investment. So these two pictures here, oh, and then what that allowed us to do was now begin to scale what we were doing and really uh, get to the point that we're in right now. So there's a picture on the bottom right, uh, our herd garden, our compost bins, our greenhouse, and our chicken coop up in that top right corner there. Uh, the left is some beautiful broccoli that we harvested from the garden that season. So the big lesson kind of coming out of those first six years is those small consistent steps compound like interest over time. And I really want you to remember that, particularly if you're feeling overwhelmed and you feel like I don't have time for this right now. There's so much to learn. Just keep going small little steps. And that's going to be the next thing we're getting into this presentation. What could those small little steps look like? And I love this quote at the bottom here. So this comes from a guy named Tony Robbins. Some of you are probably familiar with it. And I think about this one a lot. He says, people often overestimate what they can do in a year. They overestimate what they can do in a year. Uh, and even in a day, I'm guilty of that all the time. And then you get down on yourself and you feel like, oh, I thought I would have been further ahead. But they underestimate, oh, I've got a spelling typo in there. They underestimate what they can do in a decade. And that's exactly what happened um, both in the first 10 years prior to getting the homestead. Um, we were super frustrated and felt like we were far behind. And then all of a sudden we bought our homestead and we're like, we have all these skills. Wow, we accomplished a ton in this decade, even though every given year we felt behind. And then it happened again with the homestead because we've been here 10 years. The first six years, it was just like constant frustrated and kind of being down on ourselves, feeling like we're not as far as ahead as we are. But now when I look back at the decade, it's like, wow, we're in a really good place. And during this COVID pandemic, uh, emotionally, I would say that this has been a challenging year for us, but physically, it's actually been very easy. Uh, we have food, we have water, the power could go out for a month, we'd be absolutely fine. We could quarantine ourselves in our house for the next six months or even a year. Uh, and we would physically, all our needs would be covered. Uh, and we built that over the decade. So I just encourage you, if you're in that place of feeling overwhelmed, to remember that quote, people often overestimate what they can do in a year, and they underestimate what they can do in a decade. So phase five, and this is where we're at right now, is closing in the loops and our dependence on the outside world. And I want to break, burst a little bit of an illusion in a bubble. Because I remember in those early years of our homestead, people being like, oh man, you know, if the apocalypse happened or if everything fell apart, I'm going to Chris and Laura's place. Um, but those are people that don't actually know much about growing food. And the reality is, is just because we lived in the country, we have a certain degree of self-reliance. You know, we have a wood stove. So if the power goes out, we can still cook and heat ourselves. 
but we're still incredibly reliant on the modern world. We store our food in fridges. Uh, we have chickens and rabbits, but uh, where does the food come from? Oh, it actually comes from the agro food center in town. So sure, we have chickens to grow eggs, but if we can't buy the food for them from the agricultural center, then suddenly we don't have chickens, we don't have eggs, right? So there might be a bit of an illusion that just having a homestead in the country makes you sustainable or self-reliant. It's not necessarily true. But now that we've built the foundation going into state phase number five, now we're actually able to start thinking about, okay, how do we start closing some of those loops and becoming truly self-reliant now? Um, and this is a book that I want to recommend you check out. It's called The Resilient Gardener. Uh, Carol, I think her last name is Depe, D-E-P-P-E. -E. Remember, I'll be sharing a bunch of these resources in the email follow-up. She's got this book called The Resilient Gardener, and the whole premise is, is designed for the hard times, not the good times. And the essence of the book, she starts off with this really beautiful story. So she's basically a professional gardener. She grows a ton of food. She grows flowers. She's known. She's written books. She does presentations. Uh, she's known as a gardening expert. Long story short, her mother gets cancer. And all of a sudden, she's got very little time for her garden. Her, she's in a period of crisis. And her garden becomes a burden and a ton of work. And it actually stops producing very much food for her. So suddenly this thing that she thought she was an expert in is actually a burden and it's not even providing the food that she needs. And she has this wake up call that I've been designing my garden for the good times. Uh, and in the good times, it's, it's, it's a fun, it's a hobby. I don't actually need that food. In the crisis mode, in the hard times, I do actually need that garden, but I have less time and less capacity. I need to start designing my garden to be resilient, a garden that actually is helpful when times get hard. And I want to suggest that metaphor there of designing our gardens for the hard times, not the good times, can be applied to our businesses, to our career paths, to our finances. It can be applied to our garden. It can be applied to just our approach and strategy to life. And that's where we're going in this next part of the presentation um, that we're going to dive to in part three in just one moment here. But just to kind of summarize what we've done or what we're doing right now. So one thing we've brought into the homestead now is raising rabbits. Uh, they're one of the best sources of meat for the least amount of work, least amount of money, um, incredible source of meat. But on top of that, they produce tons and tons of manure. So now we're able to, again, can build soil while producing healthy calories from the land. And we're able to actually grow a good chunk of our rabbit food on the land itself. We're also, we got a rooster this year, so now we can start raising our own chicks and we're putting multiple things into play to be able to actually feed our chickens totally ourselves. One of those is the vermicomposting. So we're scaling our worm operation to grow millions of worms so we can feed a certain amount of worms to the chickens while still building soil. Uh, and we're doing other things around that. Uh, so we're looking into how do we grow and harvest the bulk of our own animal feed. Um, we're looking at how do we expand our soil so we don't need to bring in manure and compost from off-site. We're looking into collecting water. Uh, we're working in alternative energy. But these were all things we tried to do right off the bat and got overwhelmed. And what I'm sharing here is this idea of slow, consistent steps that build like interest over time gets you to the point that you can now you have a foundation in place. You're able to start filling in the holes. So it's time for an exercise right now. This is where I'm going to ask you to get out your journal. And we're going to make this part interactive. And I'm going to take you through. So I work as uh, I mentioned, one of the things that I do with my business, Chris Outdoors, is I actually do consulting for organizations and businesses around uh, emergency and disaster response, around team building and staff training, uh, and around emergency planning. Um, so if that's something, if you're part of an organization that that might be of interest to you, reach out to me at chris at chrisoutdoors.ca and we can talk about what that looks like. But I'm going to walk you through a process that I use when I work with organizations and individuals to help them make, and this it's underlined for a reason, a realistic self-reliance plan. Uh, it's great to have a big dream, but you need practical steps that actually work right now. And if you're in a place right now where you've got very little time, very little money, you're totally overwhelmed, you have to work with that. So what's actually practical in that place of overwhelm? Start there. Don't try and start in a place that you're not. So one approach to start off with is, and this is a practice that we do in the realm of emergency management, and this would be the same thing I do if a, if a municipality called me to help them with an emergency plan. So we start off by identifying what are some of our top concerns. And in emergency management, we're not going to dive into that in this workshop, but I just want to share this cool concept right here. We call it a HIRA, a Hazard Identification and Risk Assessment. 
So, and the basic idea is on the left there, you'll see I'll write down all of the possible hazards, you know, that I'm concerned about. So whether it's a house fire or a flood or a power failure or the zombies invading, um, just for all of you zombie fans out there. And then this is the secret right here is we actually score them based on the vulnerability. So what would be the impact? And then the risk, what would be the likelihood of them actually happening? And we come up with a score and then we can look at those scores and say, which have the highest numbers? Because, you know, when you start thinking about all the possible things, it's completely overwhelming, right? And that's where you're just like, I don't even want to think about this. I want to be an ostrich. I want to stick my head into the sand right now. But with the high ride, you're basically able to look at all those things, get some scores and say, oh, well, even though there's all these things, there's three or four things that actually score higher than everything else. So why don't I focus my efforts on those first? And that's the essence right there. Uh, it helps us basically uh, focus our limited resources and energy to the steps that are going to be the most leveraged and best results, the most important things to do. So I want you to take a second right now, just hit pause. And I want you to brainstorm what are three or four things that you're concerned about. And then I'm going to come back and share mine right after that. So hit pause right now and, and just write down three or four of your top concerns about the next few years. Okay, so I'll share some of my top concerns. Uh, and these aren't all of them, but these are four pretty big ones for me. So I'm really concerned about where the economy is going. Um, and I'm worried about the potential of like a large recession. Like I'm talking like great recession scale recession. And one of my worries is that, you know, back when the great recession happened, um, back in the 20s, I believe that your average person had more skill sets around shelter, water, fire, food, self-reliance than they do today. So we have a higher population with less skill sets around those core needs of life. That worries me a little bit, right? And, and that actually leads into my point for their social divide or even social unrest. But I'm worried about a recession. I'm also really worried about inflation and the increased cost of living. And what we're seeing, this, this divide where the middle class is basically disappearing and we're getting the ultra rich and everybody else. Um, I see that as a, a big concern of mine going forward. My second big concern uh, is uh, some sort of infrastructure disaster. And one of my top worries about that is actually the, the realm of cyber threats. And I wonder how much you've really thought about the reality. You know, we're going into this world where everything is hooked up onto the internet, um, AI, 5G, uh, all of these things coming down the pipe. The world is about to change so fast. I don't think most of us even realize it. And all of it is linked to the cyber world. So the ability for hackers, whether it's uh, other countries or uh, just malicious people to launch a, th a cyber threat is huge. And that cyber threat can be against you personally. I'm hearing more and more stories of ransomware where somebody basically puts ransomware on your computer and they basically take over your computer and all of your files and you have to pay them money to get it back. Or on a national level, like a cyber threat that actually attacks, like say the power grid or attacks your healthcare system. And there's all kinds of stories from the last two, three years of that happening. We, we've been lucky in Canada. We haven't had too many major ones, but there's been hospitals, there's been power plants that have been taken out in other countries by cyber attacks. So that would be an example of an infrastructure uh, disaster, uh, a large scale environmental disaster, like what, what we just witnessed in Texas. Or some sort of large scale infrastructure failure, you know, um, and back in, I think it was around 2003, we had that massive power outage over a big part of the Eastern grid of Canada and the United States. Um, it was really hot. Everyone was running their air conditionings at the same time. The load got too heavy. Uh, a couple trans, what do you call them? Um, oh my goodness, I'm getting the name, like transmitters or whatever, ended up having kind of like mini meltdowns uh, and suddenly a massive part, like millions and millions of people lost power for a long period of time. What if that happened on an even bigger scale? It's totally possible. So that's a concern of mine. Um, I know you're going to like hate me for saying this one, but uh, I think, you know, future pandemics, um, there's, there's, there's a lot of people in the world living in dense areas. Uh, there's a lot of breeding grounds for pandemics right now. So I personally think that this COVID-19 is not going to be the last big pandemic I see in my lifetime. And to be honest, as much as COVID has been a huge impact, uh, it could have been way worse. The actual virus could have been way worse than it is. And that's still possible. And another one on my radar is antibiotic resistance. Um, you know, these are bacterias and funguses that are resistant to our modern antibiotics. And this is already, you know, there's many stories, again, the last few years of hospitals having to be closed down and quarantined because they have an out of control bacteria or fungus going on there. And then the fourth one, uh, social divide. 
Um, you know, I really think social media and the internet is fueling this. Uh, we witnessed it in the States this past year with just how split we were around the election and that uprising on Capitol Hill. Uh, but I see it even in my own friends, you know, vaccine versus anti-vax, um, you know, uh, racism versus everything's okay. All of these different realms. I, I just feel like the social divide and is growing and I feel like people are becoming less compassionate and the internet is maybe making people think they're they're more informed than they actually are and is is not allowing us to be as objective in our reasoning and is compassionate in trying to understand other people's perspectives as we once were. And that's a big concern of mine as well. What's the impact of that going to be? Okay, this is number two, uh, exercise number two. So what actions, big or small, would help support you with your top concerns? In emergency management, we call this an all hazards approach. And I like to refer to it as a high leverage action. So if you, you just made your list of three or four things there, what I want you to think about is, is there one thing you could do that would actually have a positive and supportive impact on all four of those? Because if you do that first, then you've just taken a leap forward instead of a baby step forward. Um, you know, if I get focused on a real specific scenario, you know, maybe I'm worried about like a solar flare or whatever it is, and uh, I put all this effort into this one thing, but then it never happens and something else happens, well, then that blindsides me and I'm in a rough spot. But if I can take steps that actually help multiple things at the same time, then I'm basically making myself more resilient and self-reliant to a multitude of scenarios. And I think that's important when, you know, none of us actually have that looking glass to look into the future. So here's a couple examples, you know, uh, I shared this one already, but, you know, learning advanced first aid, well, that's going to help you in an earthquake, a tornado, a hurricane, a riot, a pandemic. Um, and I already referenced, you know, check out the Wilderness First Responder course or the Wilderness Advanced uh, First Aid course. Um, growing and storing food. Uh, that's going to help you in a pandemic. It's going to help you in a recession. It's going to help you in a transportation disruption. It's going to help you in a massive blackout, right? So those are high leverage actions that will actually help multiple concerns. So hit pause again here, and I want you to just look at that list of three or four things that you came up with and try and think, is there a couple actions I could take that would actually be useful in all of those and maybe make those the first step in your strategy? So now you're taking leaps forward instead of taking little baby steps forward in this. And when you take leaps forward, it's really good for our psychology too. You know, it gets us out of that place of feeling overwhelmed and we can actually pat ourselves on our back and, and feel good, which actually builds momentum. The psychological gain in preparedness is super, super important. Uh, and how do we nurture our mind and our spirit um, to, to keep on going? So hit pause, answer those questions, and then we'll move on to the next part of the exercise. Okay. Question number three for you. And this is another step that I do when I'm working with uh, organizations um, through my process. So whether it's an organic farm or whether it's an outdoor education center or whether it's a, a business, um, I'll take a look at it. We did this a ton, actually. So our business, Wild Muskoka Botanicals, we're a food producing business. And at right at the beginning of the pandemic, we thought, OK, this is going to have uh, big implications on us. Let's do a critical infrastructure audit. And that basically means what infrastructure and resources do you depend on for your health, your safety and well-being? So you can do this on a personal level, but if you're an entrepreneur or a, a small business owner, or even uh, you know in a management level of a big business, you can do a critical infrastructure level from a business level as well. You can also do it from a financial level for your personal finances. But you basically think about what are those things that we rely on? Uh, so we need shelter basically. So, you know, this is the home that I'm in, uh, something to protect me from the elements. We need clean drinking water uh, and water for cleaning and hygiene. We need, uh, you know, in a, a wilderness context, it's fire. Uh, in a modern context, it's energy. So whether that's lights, whether that's uh, the ability to plug something into the wall, whether that's the ability to cook, whether it's the ability to stay warm and stay heated, we need energy. Uh, we need food. We need health and medical uh, supplies. Uh, we need the ability to communicate. So take a look at those uh, six categories there and think about what's one, what are aspects of those that you rely on outside resources for, um, for your safety, your health, and your well-being? And what's one small step you could take with each of them to have at least a little bit more security and self-reliance, at very least as a backup plan? And, you know, I can give you a couple kind of small examples of this. You know, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we did a look at our business and we basically said, OK, you know, what are the core things that we need for this business to keep running? 
and we bought extra supplies of a bunch of stuff knowing that there could be disruptions of the uh, in the supply chain and sure enough they were and we were able to keep operational because we thought ahead and we bought those things before the disruption in the supply chain um we also started thinking about in our business well are there any parts or equipment that we use every single day um, that are essential to our production that would actually take a long time to replace um, and we thought, okay, yep, there are. So maybe we actually buy backups of these now, or we learn how to fix them now so that it doesn't take our production down for a long term. Um, so what are things you could do? You know, uh, here's a small step one for us. So most of us rely on getting our water from the taps. We bought something called a Berkey, B-E-R-K-Y, a Berkey water filter. And what this allows us to do, Berkey's actually, they take out petrochemicals they take out heavy metals they take out bacteria they take out viruses from the water and i would not live anywhere in the world without a berkey filter anymore uh, and if i lived in the city i'd actually be drinking out of my berkey every day but with a berkey filter you could literally collect rainwater off your shingled roof run it through your berkey water and drink it if water started coming out of the faucet um, so that would be an example of getting yourself a water filtration system would be one small step. Berkey's, you know, they're, they're a little bit of an investment, but it's not crazy. You could, it's something you could save for. Uh, would be one small step to actually make you more self-reliant around your water. So anyways, hit pause. Think about these categories and what you need every day and what you get from elsewhere. And think, is there some small step I could take um, that would help me be just a little bit more self-reliant or at least have a backup plan if I could not get it from the outside world? So there's question three for you to work on right now. And then question number four, uh, I love this question. Thinking about all the possible things that you could be doing right now, there's a huge list. Uh, I'm a big fan of hitting up the low hanging fruit first, especially when you feel kind of overwhelmed and like there's too much going on. And by the low hanging fruit, uh, what I mean is there, what are those things that are actually really easy to do, don't take a lot of work. Even if it's not a huge step forward, you can just check them off the list. Um, and how can you start improving increment, incrementally in these different domains? And here's kind of five domains that are really relevant to being resilient and self-reliant. So one, you want to have skills. You want to know how to do things. You know, whether that's I want to know how to grow food. Maybe I want to understand basic mechanics. Maybe I want to know how to run a chainsaw to cut wood. Uh, maybe I want to know first aid. So there's skills. There's also knowledge, you know, uh, financial knowledge. Um, knowledge about first aid and pathogens, you know, um, things like that. There's infrastructure and gear. So that's like your emergency kits, your power, that's the Berkey filter. There's also relationships, right? Social capital. If you have, the stronger your relationships are, the stronger your community, the less you personally need to know how to do. As long as you have something you can offer, then you become an ecosystem of organisms in your relationships that are able to support each other and become more resilient and self-reliant together. Um, and then the last one I put there is spirit, you know, and this has a lot of different meanings, you know, for some of you, this might be religious, uh, and your religion that you turn to. Um, when I think about spirit in this context, I'm really thinking about what's that driving force that keeps you going when things are hard, what makes you get out of bed in the morning, what's your purpose in life, uh, and how do you nurture that and tend that in a way that you have the, the mental and physical capacity to do what you need to do when you need to do it. And that might be a really big one. If you're feeling overwhelmed in life right now, if you're feeling disheartened about the state of the world, maybe your starting point is to actually deep, dig deep on that spirit question and, and really figure out how to source from that. You know, what is your purpose right now? What is your personal vision right now? Um, why is it worth figuring a way how to climb out of this hole? Um, and when you know that strongly, you'll probably find more energy and you'll start taking some leaps forward. So how can you improve incrementally in each of these skills? And maybe just throw a couple goals for yourself. And it could be a short-term and a long-term goal for skill development, knowledge development, improving the infrastructure and gear, uh, building and tending relationships, you know. In your circle of friends, uh, do you know a dentist? Do you know a doctor? Do you know a nurse? Uh, do you know a carpenter? Do you know an electrician? You know, the more people we know with different skill sets that we can call on, and then what are the skill sets you can offer those people? So in a crisis situation, which doesn't necessarily have to be a big one, it could just be day-to-day -day crises that come up all the time. You've got this network of social capital, social capital is a permaculture term by the word, uh, that makes you more resilient and self-reliant. So hit pause again and just jot down a couple pieces of low-hanging fruit around those different categories that could help you build your self-reliance.
Okay, so now we're moving into top five, uh, or sorry, part five of the presentation. We're almost done here. And I'm just going to share some of my tips around uh, my top concerns, some of the stuff I'm doing. And got to stick around to the, the end. I've got a really cool video that I want to show you at the very end. And I'm going to share some great resources for next steps. Also remember to watch your email for that. So the first one on there, I put the economy and a recession. So what are some of the things that I'm doing around that? Uh, one, I'm just, you know, um, acknowledging the elephant in the room, that there's a possibility of disruption. And I'm making that part of the game plan. And, you know, I think it'd be worthwhile. So we have businesses and we actually did an audit a few years ago of both our businesses and said, okay, if there was a major recession, would our businesses survive? What services and products do we offer that are actually reliant on there being an excess of money and people spending it freely? Because in a recession, people spend a lot less money. And when we did that audit, we realized like a lot of our business income streams would actually likely fall apart during a recession. So then we started thinking, well, we did some research and said, well, what products and services, this is the second point here, what products and services are still valuable inside of a recession? And what types of demographics of people are still likely to have money in a recession and still be spending it? And what might they be spending it on? And we very consciously added revenue streams to our businesses um, that would be likely to hold up in a recession and keep us going. And during COVID, this has actually been really helpful for us. Our businesses have actually done just fine, but that wasn't random. We actually thought about this years ago and said in a recession, how would our businesses do? Let's actually plan uh, recession resiliency into our business models now. Now, if you just work a job for somebody else, uh, it might be worth thinking what would happen to your job if we had like a major recession? And I'm not even talking 2008. I'm talking like 1920s Great Recession. Would your job still be there? And I'm not saying you should leave your job if it's not. I'm saying if you think that your job is vulnerable, you might want to start having the plan B in place right now and start again thinking about those two questions. Where will there be money and what skills, services, products um, are likely to do there? And is there something that you could develop in the background to have there? Another thing that we started doing, so, you know, we chatted about learning from nature and examples from nature. Nature thrives because of diversity. A forest with many, many different tree species, if uh, something like, um, you know, a pine weevil comes in or, you know, beech bark disease, that's a great one. Um, all of the beech trees are dying in the eastern part of North America right now. It's super, super sad. But our eastern forests, our eastern woodlands have many, many species. So even though beech are an important part of that climate, as the beach die, these other trees just kind of fill in that niche. Um, it's resilient because of diversity. Uh, if we only had beach trees and this disease came through, it would wipe out everything. All the trees would die, all the wildlife would die, and then the land would start to die. Uh, really, really scary, right? So we can think about the same thing from an economic perspective. How do we add uh, diversity to the revenue streams that we have? Whether this is the revenue streams in our business or whether this is you personally, you know, I've got maybe one revenue stream from my job. I've got another revenue stream from, you know, some little side uh, service that I've created or side business. Uh, and maybe I've got another revenue stream coming in from investments that are actually somewhat um, protected or um, have the thought of a recession built into how I choose those investments to begin with, right? The more revenue streams we have, if one revenue stream dries up, well, I've still got some revenue here. Or if all of them take a hit, at least I've got a trickle from multiple revenue streams. And then another one, uh, self-reliance, right? Growing food is still really relevant, relevant in a recession. So here's some of the steps that I took specifically. Uh, one, I already mentioned this, but we started uh, researching, you know, what were needs in recessions. And we both looked at historical recessions. But then we also thought ahead a little bit to think about, you know, uh, where is the world at right now? And what might future needs be in a recession in our, in our modern context and climate? So that was really helpful. Uh, another step I took is uh, actually consciously increasing my financial literacy or sometimes called your financial IQ. And this is not something that I had any personal interest in ever really in my life. I actually just realized that if I want to be serious about sustainability and uh, self-reliance, then finances are just a realistic part of that. And, you know, the more I study financial literacy, and this looks like reading books about finances and economics, listening to podcasts, taking courses on things like accounting and money management. Um, and the more I do that, the more I realize that there is a serious link between poverty and financial literacy. And, you know, financial literacy, it's not taught in schools and it's often not taught in homes. It's kind of taboo in our world. Uh, I've had to go out and mostly learn this on my own. 
And I'm like, wow, with some of the stuff I've learned in the last couple of years, if I had learned this 10 years ago, I'd probably be way further ahead. I would have gotten out of some of the challenges and these ruts that we get in where we're just living um, one meal to the next. Um, and there, there's a skill set around financial literacy. So I'm a huge proponent now of people actually um, learning about financial literacy, increasing their financial IQ as one of many skill sets when it comes to resiliency. Um Cool. The other step we talked about a lot already, you know, this idea of focusing on those high yield foods and the low work crops um, for us, you know, or here's some great examples, rabbits uh, growing sprouts indoors. That's something you could even do in the city. You know, at the start of pande the pandemic, my wife and I ordered a massive bag of sprouting seeds. There's a great source of micronutrients you can grow in a small amount of face space and just grow them over and over again. Um, I mentioned asparagus. I mentioned how much I love shiitake mushroom growing. Uh, I actually have another course that's coming out soon on how to grow your own mushrooms. Uh, so if you're interested in that one, go check out chrisoutdoors.ca. Uh, it may or may not be up yet, depending on when you watch it. Um, but I do have a grow your own mushrooms course. Uh, beans, squash, uh, brassicas, potatoes. Those are some of the, the crops that do really well. So for those of you that are thinking about, you know, well, maybe I want to set up another income stream online. Um, Again, I'm actually thinking about running some webinars, kind of sharing everything I've learned from the past like four or five years of exploring this online world. Um, and I've learned a lot, kind of like the garden. I started off with a lot of work, making a lot of mistakes, um, not really making anything. And then all of a sudden it was like four years of banging my head off of the screen, spending too much time on the computer, almost being ready to quit. And then everything clicked at once, like compound interest. And suddenly it's like, wow, I have a viable online business with multiple income streams. So I might actually run a webinar that if that interests you, maybe email me at chris at chrisoutdoors.ca and just let me know you'd be interested in that. And if I have enough interest, I might run that. Beyond that, though, one of my big mentors is this guy, Pat Flynn. He has an awesome podcast called the Smart Passive Income Podcast, where he basically interviews people with really creative online business ideas. Um, and you, you learn a ton and it just plants a lot of seeds for possibilities. And he has an amazing course that he calls smart from scratch that I actually took. And the whole idea is how do you validate a business idea before you spend a lot of time and money on it? I wish I started this at the beginning of my journey. It's how do you know that your business is going to work before you even start it? Super smart thinking. And these two books that I recommend ask and choose by Ryan Levesque are along those same streams. They're two of the best business books I've uh, ever read. And choose is basically, okay, there's all these possibilities. How do you choose a business idea or product where you know there's a market and you know it's going to work ahead of time? And ask is once you choose the, uh, the industry you want to work on, instead of just coming up with an idea in your head and making it, you actually ask people what you want them to make. So you know that you have a market to sell it to. So those are some great resources if you're thinking about new income streams. A um, couple other ones. So now let's move on to infrastructure. Um, when it comes to my concerns around a collapse in infrastructure, whether it's cyber, environmental, um, uh, infrastructure failure. Um, so here's some high leverage actions, in my opinion. So food, having a way to cook without power. That's a huge one. And interesting enough, you know, uh, where we live in the country, I mean, we can cook on our wood stove. We can also cook over the fire outside. Um, I did an interview with a guy named Grant who was actually in Puerto Rico when Hurricane Maria basically flattened it. And he lived in the aftermath. And something really interesting he said, if you think about self-reliance. So you might not think about propane as being something that makes you more self-reliant. But electricity, you're reliant on the electrical grid, right? If the electricity, if the electrical grid goes down, you have no electricity. Propane is something that you physically have at your place. So interesting enough, after Hurricane Maria, he said it was like went dead still and got crazy stinking hot. And they had a lot of illness and even deaths related from the heat um, afterwards. And he said people that had propane um, for cooking and for air conditioning did very well. People that were on the electrical grid for cooking and air conditioning didn't have it. And thus people that had propane were more self-reliant because they basically owned the infrastructure for their, their heating and their, um, their cooking and their air conditioning. So there's just a thought there thinking about, you know, how do you become more self-reliant in power? Um, creating a long-term food cache. This is something I highly, highly recommend. And actually, you know what? I didn't put it on this year, but probably one of the best starting points. There's this really neat guy, Creek Stewart is his name. And he runs an outdoor school called Outdoor Core. He's also kind of a TV celebrity down in the States. 
Um, he has a show, I think it's called uh, Could You Survive or something. But he's actually really legit. He's a really nice guy. I was actually a guest instructor on one of his survival shows once. Um, and he, so if you go to outdoorcore.com, I'll actually send the link probably in the follow up to this. But he has a course on how to create an emergency food and water cache. It's a phenomenal price and it's ridiculous how much he actually includes in this course for the price. So check out that course on Outdoor Core. Um, but here's a couple other suggestions for long term food storage. Uh, the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So I don't prescribe to that religion, but they have LD, uh, uh, canning centers all over the world. Part of their religion is food security uh, and emergency preparedness. So they actually can food into cans that have a 10 year shelf life and, or sorry, some of them even a 20 year shelf life. And they provide this almost at a uh, cost to the public is like a good deed. So you can actually go to these LDS canning centers and buy long-term food cans for super cheap. So every few years, we just invest in a couple boxes of the stuff and keep storing it away. And now we've got a food, uh, if there's a pandemic, if there's a long-term power outage, uh, if there's a recession and we lose our income, we, we're building this long-term food stash. And we even thought, you know, let's imagine, so we're doing all of this stuff for financial resiliency, we're growing their businesses. That's kind of our retirement plan. Well, what if that all falls apart? What if our business goes bankrupt? Um, our finances go belly side up and we're at a later stage in life where it's not practical to be working anymore. We're in a real mess all of a sudden. Well, if we're actually building long-term food stashes uh, our whole life with these 20 year storages, now we've got a whole bunch of food that we're able to actually eat in our retirement when we don't have money um, to, actually, to actually be purchasing stuff. So interesting there. Uh, if you're looking for healthier canned food with a long life, check out Thrive Foods. Um, they have freeze dried vegetables, meats, fruits, and even, uh, cheeses. Uh, they're, they're fairly expensive, but it's really good quality stuff. So I buy my staples from LDS canning center. So things like potato flakes and grain and rice and beans, I go to thrive and that's where I get in the micronutrients, tomatoes and broccoli and, uh, ground beef and things of that nature. Um, there's also a company called Rapid Survival, um, and they've got some great stuff actually from first aid kits to emergency gear, but they also sell some long-term food kits there as well. Uh, I'll send all of those links in the follow-up email I mentioned, so watch for that. Okay, we're almost done here, folks. We're about to wrap up. I know we're a little bit over an hour right now, so we're, we're in the home stretch here. Uh, water, massive step that you can take. Learn how to collect, store, and purify water. Learn to collect, store, and purify water. Water is life. It's so essential. Build your skills and your knowledge around that. And I already referenced this Berkey filters. There's an amazing company, Conscious Water, um, ConsciousWater.ca. Uh, I'm going to send out a link actually to their site. I actually have an affiliate link for them too because I'm such a big fan of Berkey. So if you're going to order a Berkey water filter, can you please use the link in the email I sent you? Or just email me and ask me for the link and I'd greatly appreciate it. I get a very small affiliate commission, but it helps me offer free stuff like this. Uh, but remember, the Berkey water filters, they take out chemicals, they take out heavy metals, um, they take out pharmaceuticals, they take out bacteria, viruses. Even if you're drinking tap water in the city, I'd run your tap water through the Berkey filter first. We use ours every single day at home, but in an emergency, we can literally collect roof water or take water out of puddles for that matter and drink it through our Berkey filter. Um, and the ability to create and store a small amount of energy, that's a huge high leverage step when it comes to infrastructure as well. That could be as simple as going to the camping store and getting some solar panels, like the ones you bring camping in a small battery system. So at least you can charge your phone if the grid goes down or you know basic appliances. Uh, I already mentioned propane versus electrical. Having a fireplace, you know, even if I, if I lived in the city, I would put a wood stove in my house anyways. It gives me so much peace of mind living in a house with a wood stove where I know if it's the middle of winter and the power goes out for a week, I can stay warm and I can cook. Um, so having a fireplace and a wood stove, I'm sure you could think of all kinds of other ideas around how to create and store energy. Okay, uh, cybersecurity. This is a big one. I'm going to actually, the first email I follow up, I'm going to actually resend you this list. So I'll go through it really quick right now. But I mentioned this is something like, so I was actually chatting with a friend of mine who's a cybersecurity expert um, just a couple of weeks ago. He actually does this for the government. And he said that, excuse me, uh, that like 90% of the population are low hanging fruit fruit for hackers and that he thinks we're going to see massive uptick in cyber crime both on businesses and governments but also on individuals and he said most individuals are just not taking it seriously enough and ironically just the other day my website got hacked 
Um, and fortunately, I had some of this stuff in place and it was easy to get it back. But identity theft can be a nightmare. Um, ransomware can be a nightmare, really mess up your life. And especially if you're a business, uh, if you're a business and you want help actually with some of this stuff, reach out chris at chrisoutdoors.ca. Um, and I do do custom consulting um, on how to make your business more kind of uh, prepared and resilient towards emergencies. But anyways, here's some best practices that basically remove you from being the low hanging fruit from a cyber attacker. So one, ransomware is becoming huge. And ransomware basically means that somebody hacks into your computer and all of a sudden you're on your computer and the screen goes blank and something comes up and basically says like, hey, you got to give us $10,000 in Bitcoin or we're not going to give you your data back. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a lot of important files on my computer these days. Um, now, I have them in encrypted folders, so that person probably couldn't even access them anyways. But if somebody shut down my computer, it would be a big problem. So I have an encrypted and automatic backup system in place where my computer is constantly uploading to a cloud-based service. Um, I use a service called Backblaze, but it encrypts the files so people can't get a hold of them even if they find the files there. Um, so that, number one, super important. If someone attacks me with ransomware, um, you know, I'm just going to give them the finger and say, no, I'm not giving you money because I can just basically delete my entire computer hard drive and then go to my Backblaze account and be back up and running in an hour. Um, and just let them take everything, knowing that because it's encrypted, they can't even look at it anyways. Um, so number two, and this is the simplest one, but so many people don't do it. Make sure every login you use, you create a unique password, especially for your email accounts and your bank accounts. A unique password. Don't use the same password over and over, because if someone gets one password, they're going to start hitting others. And people are getting really good at stealing identity and, and hacking people here. You may want to consider using a password manager. That's what I use. I use LastPass. There's also one called OnePass. Uh, and basically, there's one password that I memorize in my head, but it creates a long password for all of my sites. Every single one of them unique makes it way harder to hack. On top of that, make sure your passwords, especially the important ones, and when I think important, here's my top three important passwords. Your bank accounts and investment accounts, any government accounts that you're connected to, and your email. And you might say, well, my email, I'm just emailing with my friends. Why is that important? People that are trying to come after you for identity theft, if they can get into your email, they can learn so much about you. And if they can get into your email, they can use your email to start hacking into your other more important accounts like your bank account. So make sure every password is at least 16 digits long and unique. That's super important. Next, set up two-factor authentication for any accounts that you can, again, especially the important ones. So especially banks, government sites, email accounts. Two-factor authentication basically means that when I go to log into my email, and yes, I do this at the email, it takes an extra couple of seconds, but that's way better than spending two to three years and tens of thousands of dollars trying to get your identity back or having your credit score completely destroyed because someone stole your identity. So when I go to log into my email, a little password pops up on my phone um, and I can't, so basically someone can't get into my email without my phone. Um, now, of course, you got to protect your phone so they can't, someone can't get in your phone, but that's easy with a passcode and encrypting it as well. Um, here's a great one. Don't use the same email login for your bank and government and investment accounts that you do for social media, right? If you log into Facebook, Instagram, whatever it is that you use, don't use TikTok. It's one of the worst for hackers um, and for data uh, breaches. But anyways, um, I, I, don't, I don't use Facebook or Instagram. I don't use any of them anymore just because of um, the, the invasiveness on privacy. But that's another, that's my personal opinion there. Anyways. Think about it this way though, if you use Facebook and you use the same email to log into Facebook that you use to log into your bank account or to your government tax account um, to do your, your tax filings, well, somebody that's spying on you on Facebook can say, oh, I bet they use the same email. They're one step closer to hacking that other account. So for my government accounts, I actually have an email address that nobody knows except for myself and my wife. I don't message anyone through it. I never use it as a login but it's the login for my government sites and my bank accounts, nothing else. So it just makes it that much harder. So now they not only do they need to get my password, they also need to figure out what that email is. And because I never email anyone with that address, it's gonna be really hard for the, anyone to even know that that address exists and that it's connected to a bank account. So there's a thought. Um, here's a super simple one. Review the basic security settings in whatever web browser that you use, whether it's Google Chrome or Firefox or Safari. Um, just review kind of the security settings and make sure that you've got the most protective things in there, you know? 
Um, you know, there's basic settings that make sure every site you come to, when there's the HTTP, you want to have an S in there. Uh, it's a little bit more secured if you have the S. And you know, on my web browser, if a site doesn't have that S, it'll send up a little warning sign and say, are you sure you wanna look at the site, you know? Uh, my web browser, if a site has any chance of being malicious, it'll give me a warning. So make sure you have those settings turned on in your web browser. And then the very last one, this is a great one as well. You can actually check your credit report for free here in Canada, and I think you can in the States. So consider checking your credit report a couple of times a year. And what you're doing here is making sure that there's not, you know, someone hasn't created a visa under your name and they're using it over in Europe, but you don't even know that that was created. Um, or someone's draining money from you or making purchases under your identity. So this is to protect you from identity theft. Um, you can use this service called Equifax in Canada and the United States. Uh, I believe they allow you to do one free credit check a year. Um, so think about once or twice a year, just check getting your credit score or your credit report. And you're basically looking for fishy activity. The sooner you catch something like that, the less likely you are to not end up in a mess. And again, I've heard identity theft stories where people literally spend years and tens of thousands of dollars trying to secure their identity again. And often it destroys their ability to, you know, get a mortgage and things like that. So, um, and then our very last topic here, pandemics and antibiotic resistance. So this is a big topic. Uh, this should be a whole webinar on its own, but here's a few things to think about. Again, the self-reliance skills and the food cache, it just allows me to hunker down if things get out of control. Uh, social capital, do you have healthcare workers in your friend network? Um, that's something to maybe consider. Herbal medicine, I think, is one of our best tools um, for fighting antibiotic resistance and even potential some of these new strains that are coming up with us. Um, so I've got two resources for that. One, there's a, I've done some of my herbal training through a guy named Sam Kaufman. He has a school called Human Path and he runs a course called the Herbal Medic. Uh, it's an online course and it's a phenomenal introduction to herbal medicine. You can also check out my wife, Laura, wildmuskokabotanicals.com. Um, she runs an in-person uh, herbal medicine course called the Wild Medicine Program. But two books that are so important for our time. Um, herbal, oh, I spelt the names wrong in these books. It should say, her, uh, oh, what is it? Antiviral Herbs and Herbal Antibiotics. Yeah, okay, so the first one should say Herbal Antibiotics is the name of the book. The author is Stephen Buhner. And it's a whole bunch of clinical research on herbs that actually might be able to fight some of the um, bacterias that are becoming resistant to antibiotics. And there's clinical data supporting this, um, case studies. Um, the other one is on herbal antivirals, so herbs that can actually help you with viruses. So those are two like must-haves for me in my bookshelf. Okay, so we're about to wrap up here. I got a video I really want to show you just to finish this off. I think you're going to think it's kind of neat um, and it might plant some ideas for you for next steps in your training. But I'm going to share a couple of other offerings that I have before we, we close it out here. Uh, thanks so much for joining me, by the way. Feel free to reach out with any emails you have. Um, I mentioned my consulting services. So whether it's for a small business, whether it's for an organization, uh, potentially even for an individual or a family, we could put something custom together. Um, so, so check out chrisoutdoors.ca. That's my website. Wild. Oh, you know what? I'm going to, this is the slide I want here. So here's some next steps. Check your email for a list of the follow-up resources. So I'm gonna be sending training next steps, free videos, checklists, gear suggestions, and other recommended resources. So I'll be sending those out in the coming days. My contact is chris at chrisoutdoors.ca um, and I offer consulting. As far as next steps for training, uh, here's some opportunities if you wanna go deeper with me and if you like kind of that, that holistic approach I have. One is a course I created, it's called Survive the Storms and I'm offering 40% off to anyone watching this uh, webinar. Uh, and that's 40, if it's listed on sale already, because I do put it on sale frequently, this 40% will be off of the sale price. So it'll be an additional 40% from whatever you see on the website if you enter STS40 as a coupon code. Uh, in essence, Survive the Storms, it's a seven day gamified e-course and it's meant to make uh, emergency preparedness fun. So I created a mock survival scenario, kind of like I do with governments when we go out and do these trainings. And we basically walk you through a mock survival storm. So each day you watch a professionally filmed video and it's basically a newscast talking about the storm of the century. And then you're given a challenge to complete. Uh, so we talk about situational awareness. We chat about, you know, one of maybe the most important things, a family emergency communications plan. So what if you're separated from your family and a disaster happens? How are you getting back together if there's no phone and internet and you can't go home? Do you have a plan for that? Like that's terrifying to me to like not be able to get back together with my wife, not know where she is and not be able to get home and we're in a crisis. 
So put a plan in place ahead of time so you know what you would do. So we get into that, communication plans. We talk about emergency kits. Uh, we talk about collecting, purifying, and storing water. Uh, we talk about health hazards and hygiene hazards during a disaster and after a disaster when you're in a world of disease and mold and all of these things. Uh, we chat about working with nature to build our resilience. Uh, I'm really proud of it. It's a really quality course. So survivethestorms.com, STS40 for 40% off. Uh, another one here, hunting is a big part of my journey. I know that's a controversial topic, but I'll tell you that people have been hunting on this land for thousands and thousands of years. And certain populations of animals, particularly deer and turkey, populations are actually higher now than they were 100 years ago in the part that I live right now. And people have been hunting that entire time. Hunting's actually been growing in popularity and populations of some of the animals we hunt are actually going up. So if you don't think hunting's sustainable, well then how does that work? Now, you need to know a lot though. And, and the argument that I will say here is that there are a lot of hunters that aren't ecologists and they're probably not sustainable in the approach that they hunt. So we've got a, this has been a big part of my journey. It's how I feed my family. I feel that it's like it's some of the most sustainable and ethical meat I can eat and some of the healthiest meat I can eat. So I have a, a program that I run with a good friend of mine, uh, Caleb Musgrave. Uh, he's uh, Anishinaabe, he's from Hiawatha First Nation, and the two of us teach this together. And we call it the hunter's journey. And it's really about preparing yourself mentally and physically if you think hunting is something you'd like to be part of your life journey and you want to do it in an ethical and sustainable way that is also making sure that there's still species there to hunt, um, you know, seven generations from now. So you can check out the hunter's journey to learn about that. Uh, registration may or may not be open when you go to the page, but when you land there, there should be a place to at least get on the waiting list if it's not open. And the last one I want to mention... Um, I think just knowledge of nature is absolutely key to our resiliency. So I have this other course called um, Reading Nature's Language. Uh, ignore the Forgotten Language. We've actually changed the name of the course. But it's the online course that takes you outside. And it's basically about learning to read and interpret all of the tracks and the signs and the sounds of nature. Um, and I think this is foundational knowledge uh, just to being a human, to being a good steward, but also really relevant when it comes to your own self-reliance and resiliency. So you can go to learnnaturesanguage.com and if you enter the code TRACKS, you'll get 20% off that training. And this is a mixture of pre-recorded material that you can do at your own pace, uh, an online community to ask questions, to post pictures. And then we do these things we call virtual campfires, which are these live classes uh, and live trainings where you get community and you get mentoring from me and the other instructor. So learnnaturesanguage.com, um, thehuntersjourney.com, and survivethestorms.com. And then let's finish it up with this last short video here. Wildfires. Floods. Earthquakes. Volcanic eruptions. Hurricanes. I keep hearing stories of people saying they never expected something like this to happen to them until it did. I'm Chris Gilmore, emergency preparedness consultant and wilderness survival instructor. I've worked with businesses, governments, and thousands of people and families over my career. I've come to learn that a little bit of preparedness goes a long ways when it comes to your family's safety. And unfortunately, most people don't even have the basics covered. This is why I've teamed up with eCourse Adventures. And together, we've created an online learning experience unlike anything else out there. One that's designed to get you results quickly and is also realistic to accomplish even with a busy life schedule. Survive the Storms is a seven day online learning adventure where we guide you step by step in learning new skills and creating a real and custom disaster preparedness plan for you and your family. The goal is to give you a new sense of confidence for if the weather takes a turn for the worst or a disaster strikes. So here's how the adventure works. Each day we send you a short and entertaining video lesson to follow along to. A newscast updating you on the storm of the century and your next steps to survive. Sound fun? You could even do it with a group of friends or your kids. Just follow along with our easy yet effective exercises designed to be integrated into your normal day and develop the peace of mind that you've got the skills to survive in our changing world and changing climate. And we'll even offer you a 100% money back guarantee in case you change your mind or you're not completely satisfied. That's how amazing and important we think this training is. So protect your family, make a plan, and survive the storm. So what do you think? Look fun? Um, 
that's my uh, that's my attempt to, and I actually think a really good attempt to make emergency preparedness super practical, super engaging. Uh, and remember, if you put STS40, you'll get 40% off. So thanks, everybody. I hope you really enjoyed this experience. Uh, I hope you'll join us for future, future free trainings. Uh, you're on the news list now, so watch for future emails and watch for the follow-up from this. Other than that, stay aware, stay safe, and stay positive. Cheers, everyone. Chris Gilmore signing off.